the best diet for insulin resistance, the best diet for diabetes has really been right in front of us when you start looking at the makeup. And I'm going to take you through step by step why, but I'm also going to give you a very specific protocol that you can follow that's towards the end of this video, but it's not going to make a lot of sense unless you kind of have the educational piece up front. This is something that the American Diabetic Association and Diabetes UK agree on, which is nice to see this, right? So first of all, they all agree that refined starches, refined sugars, refined grains should be out of the equation, which goes against the grain of what some people say. Some people say it doesn't matter, just, just reduce calories. Well, no, even the Diabetic Association say this. They also say reduce sugar. They also say increase starchy vegetables and higher fiber content. Okay, it sounds like something pretty easy, but we can get more granular. For the first time in history, the American Diabetic Association has acknowledged and noted that for type 2 diabetes, a low carb protocol is very, very viable. This doesn't mean it has to be keto. It can just be low carb, which we're going to talk about how this works and what you can do. Because again, you can have up to 150 grams of carbohydrates on a low carb Mediterranean style. And we're going to talk about that. So don't be freaked out thinking you have to do keto if you don't want to. It's just nice to hear this because for years, the lower carb community comes under fire that it's not effective. But now even the diabetic associations are saying, no, low carb works great. Maybe it's not better, maybe it's not worse, but it works just as well as some of these other modalities. So the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition published a paper that was fascinating. Okay, and it took a look at what is called a well-crafted or a well-formulated low-carb ketogenic diet compared to what is called Mediterranean Plus. Mediterranean Plus is a Mediterranean diet that is rich in poly and monounsaturated fats, also moderately high amounts of protein, moderate amounts of protein, lower amounts of saturated fat, higher amounts of vegetables. The only real difference between these two diets, believe it or not, is the Mediterranean diet had more legumes, had some whole grains, and had a fair bit of fruit. So other than that, the diets were actually the same. And that's what's funny, because we think Mediterranean, be like, I don't want that, that's a bunch of carbs. The only real difference is some legumes and some fruit. Because a well-crafted ketogenic diet with Volick and Finney, who really had created that, that protocol, that name, most of the fats are coming from poly and monounsaturated fats. Okay, now when you think keto, you think cheese, you think bacon, you think ribeye steaks, and that's fine in moderation, right? But a well-crafted or a well-formulated ketogenic diet actually has those things coming in a little bit later and putting the poly and monounsaturated fats, like the fish oils, like the olive oil, the avocado oil, putting those at the forefront. So they had these subjects eat these diets ad libitum for 12 weeks. Ad libitum means they could eat as much as they wanted to, like eat until they're full. And on average, they both ended up eating to about 1,800-ish calories. So satiety levels were actually about the same. They all ended up eating about the same amount of calories. So in that case, they're both great diets. The results were very, very, very similar. Both had huge reductions in HbA1c, big improvements overall. And a lot of these things were statistically insignificant, but there were some things that we need to note, okay? Triglycerides, for example. Triglycerides in the lower carb group, like the Mediterranean keto group, the well-crafted keto group, reduced 16%. Compared to Mediterranean, they reduced 5%. Now, we'll explain why. This still is actually statistically insignificant, even though it sounds like a big number, but I have a reason as to why this happened. As far as body fat loss was concerned, the well-crafted ketogenic diet lost 8% body fat. The Mediterranean diet lost 7% body fat that's not even worth mentioning. Like that's basically the same. Now here's what's interesting. There was an 11% increase in good cholesterol, HDL, in the keto group and a 7% increase in the Mediterranean group. So still good, modest increases, but a slight increase more so in the well-crafted keto group. What was interesting is the Mediterranean group had a dramatic decrease in LDL huge decrease in LDL, whereas the well-crafted keto diet had just a small decrease. So the LDL, HDL question kind of balances itself out. But why is this happening? Because if you are dealing with type 2 diabetes, this is a painful issue for you, and you need to understand the why because it can help you make informed decisions. The LDL content probably went down more so in the Mediterranean group because of the fiber intake, and that's what research hypothesized. Like more legumes, more fruit, the fiber intake was just higher, and that can help sort of extricate and can potentially reduce LDL a little bit. So that question gets answered there. Now, why did we see triglycerides drop? Triglycerides matter for diabetes, by the way, okay, because they can be sort of a uh, 
like a precursor to a lot of other things, but I'll touch on this briefly. It's speculated that with the keto group, their triglycerides went down because there were more polyunsaturated fats. Okay, polyunsaturated fats brought down triglycerides in both groups, but the amount, the quantity of polyunsaturated fats in the keto group was higher because it's a higher fat diet. So it brought it down. But the big equation is reducing carbs brings down triglycerides too. Okay, so the impact of polyunsaturated fats being added was beneficial in both groups, but couple that with the absence of carbohydrates, that just accelerated the triglyceride decrease. The big piece we need to talk about is the monounsaturated fats. The olive oils, the olives themselves, the avocado oils, the good healthy nuts, but specifically things like macadamia nuts, which I think are like probably the best diabetes, insulin resistance, powerhouse food that you can eat. This was probably responsible for a lot of the improvement in insulin sensitivity. Now there's a study published in clinical experiments in pharmacology and physiology. It looked at subjects that were consuming coconut bread, butter bread, and macadamia nut bread daily for a few weeks. Okay, And they were about the same amount of calories, but the only group that lost weight with this intervention was the macadamia nut bread group. Not because macadamia nuts are magical, but because the differentiating factor between these was the presence of monounsaturated fats. That's the literal only thing within these breads that was different. The monounsaturated fats are hugely impactful. Now, another study, this is super important, so I'm gonna keep it basic and not go crazy dense, but it was published in Endocrinology. The problem we run into when it comes down to our pancreas and producing insulin is we negatively impact our pancreas. We kill pancreatic beta cells. And these pancreatic beta cells, when they die, they can't produce insulin. So glucose goes up and we run into a diabetic issue, right? Well, when fats are present in the blood along with high levels of glucose, they have a synergistically negative effect and they kill those pancreatic cells. And this has been demonstrated in in vitro studies, hasn't been replicated directly in humans just yet, but it's very interesting. So any fat will do that. High amount of fat with high amount of sugar basically puts the pancreas into shock and it kind of kills those cells. With the exception of one fat, monounsaturated fat omega-9. This particular fat, which again, we find in macadamia nuts, very interesting, can be elevated along with high glucose and have a positive impact and does not impact our pancreas. So it's the only fat that I know of, at least in in vitro research, that can be combined with someone that already has high glucose to not further an issue. But then omega-7s, which is another monounsaturated fat that you find in macadamia nuts, palmitoleic acid, this has been demonstrated to increase GLUT4 and GLUT1 translocation, which in English means it helps glucose into the cell. Who would ever think in the presence of a fat would impact that? Well, the one fat that is most prevalent in a Mediterranean diet is a monounsaturated fat. So the improvements in insulin sensitivity in both the keto group and the Mediterranean group could largely be driven by monounsaturated fats because guess what? This particular form of keto was a Mediterranean keto. A well-crafted ketogenic diet is basically Mediterranean diet minus the starches. So the fats that were the common denominator had this huge positive impact. So whether you go Mediterranean or not, if you influence with some of these Mediterranean fats, you have a big impact. Regardless of what diet you're doing, I think macadamia nuts are a great addition. Add more calories from macadamia nuts and replace other fats with those. My favorite macadamia nuts, I put a link down below for a company called House of Macadamia. If you are looking for a unique way to get them in, they are the only company that I know of that has macadamia nut bars where the literal first ingredient is macadamia nuts. No fluff, no garbage, not somewhere down in the ingredient list, the literal first flipping ingredient. It's awesome, okay? And then also, when you look at their just range of products, they have sugar-free chocolate covered, they have sugar-free white chocolate covered macadamia nuts, and they have a whole array of different flavors like onion, they have salsa flavor, just a great fun way to get them in. But I stand behind what they're doing, okay? They farm, they harvest right in South Africa, which is like the heart of where you can grow macadamia nuts. They process and manufacture just like an hour away from there they actually grow. So there is serious integration and control there, and they're supporting a lot of the local farmers and really just doing positive things. So that link down below will save you 20% off if you use that code. 20% off whatever you wanna get through House of Macadamia is using that link 
down below. Now, the nitty gritty of this. How do you put this into effect? We've established that at least based upon my opinion and the research that I've seen, this is probably the best approach. And I think the American Diabetic Association and Diabetes UK would probably agree that one of these two is probably a really good option, right? I don't want to put words in their mouth, but it kind of infers it. So there was actually a study that was published in Nutrients that showed us how to cycle these kinds of diets accordingly. First off, how do you do these diets? Okay. So what I want you to take a look at is with the Mediterranean style diet, I want you to limit your carbohydrates at 150 grams. 150 grams of carbs is your upper limit, okay? And that is all gonna come from fruit and legumes. Okay, I don't even want you to do the grains unless you really feel like you need to. And if they're gonna be grains, try to keep it gluten-free. That's just a personal preference for me, okay? With that, 150 grams tops, everything else should be a 50-50 split protein and fats, okay? Simple, let's make it easy. A 50-50 split, one-to-one -one ratio of protein and fats outside of those 150 grams of carbohydrates, okay? Very, very simple. Now, you don't even have to go up to that 150 grams. You can keep it lower, right? Now, additionally, your fats should be comprised of about 20 to 30 to 40% polyunsaturated. I would really like to see at least 40% monounsaturated and about 20 to 25, maybe 30% saturated. So the lion's share of them coming from monounsaturated, like olive oil, some good healthy nuts if you wanna have them occasionally, avocado oil, all of themselves, avocados themselves, eat tons of them, even though they're not Mediterranean, they still fit the mold. And then the keto version of that is literally, in my opinion, gonna be the same thing just with, without the carbs. The only carbs are coming from your vegetables, okay? So you don't even have to bother counting them. Just eat your vegetables, eat your leafy greens, eat the Brussels sprouts, eat the broccoli, eat the asparagus. I wouldn't worry too much about those carbohydrates. I would argue that you could probably eat pretty much unlimited asparagus and probably still be in a ketogenic state if you're really trying to go that route. Now, Volick and Finney might not agree with the fact that I say have a 50% protein intake, but I think based upon other research, protein is so critical for your overall just muscle mass, overall glucose sink, overall satiety, metabolic stabilization as you get older, I'm gonna go off that tangent a little bit and say prioritize protein at 50% of your calories protein, 50% fats. Same ratio, 20% saturated, 40-ish, 30 to 40% polyunsaturated, and about 40% monounsaturated. Now here's how you cycle it based upon a study published in Nutrients. Do 20 days of the very low carb keto version that I described, okay? 20 days of very low carb keto. Then do 20 days of the Mediterranean low carb with the 150 grams of carbs from fruit and legumes. So 20 days keto, 20 days Mediterranean. Now the journal Nutrients suggests that you do after this four months of Mediterranean maintenance with the 150 grams of carbs. I personally would suggest doing about two months. Okay, so you do 20 days of keto, 20 days of Mediterranean, and then you increase your calories to maintenance a little bit, and you do a general Mediterranean diet once again with an upper limit of 150 grams of carbs for about two months. Again, Journal Nutrient says four months, I think two months. Then after those two months are done, you go back to about 20 days of the very low carb keto Mediterranean. So you're just bouncing back and forth. And then after that 20 days, you go back onto the Mediterranean for about two months. So you're kind of doing like 60 days of low-ish carb with Mediterranean, 20 days keto. 60 days, 20 days. You can flip this however you want. I just don't want to overcomplicate this video. The reason I say you can flip this is cycling is just what's important here. I think that what you gain from fiber and potential starches within the Mediterranean approach is very, very good. But I also think what you get from going very low carb, just systemically and from various gene processes and everything that happens in your body in that state is beneficial too. The overarching theme here is go back and forth, back and forth. You could even go half the time here, half the time there. Just try to switch it up at least every 60 days, okay? So you might wanna go back, rewind, watch this section again, because I know there was a lot. Write this down because this could be very helpful, because I really could go on record by saying at least I personally feel this could be the best strategy for diabetes and insulin resistance. But I'm just a guy on the internet, so I'll see you tomorrow.